Um, let me introduce uh, Professor Regina Harrison. Regina Harrison is a professor of Spanish, Quechua, Comparative Literature and Anthropology at the University of Maryland. She is a visiting faculty member at the Universidad Andina Simón Bolívar in Quito, uh, and also a founding madrina of the university in, in Quito, right? Um, and a faculty member of the Center, uh, Centro de Estudios Regionalistas Andinos, Bartolomé Las Casas, in Cusco, Peru. At the multiple intersection of anthropology and literature, Spanish, English, Quechua, film and activism, colonial studies, human rights, and history of religion, Regina Harrison engages in research relevant to the world, research that reaches and involves others, their knowledge, their faith, their poetry, their memories, their political and economic struggles, and their victories, their past, their presence, and also the dreams of the future. She has been awarded several, many research fellowships uh, from, for example, the Social Science Research Council, the American Council of Learned Societies, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Fulbright, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Mellon Foundation, and the Simone Guggenheim Foundation. Her publications include her Still Warm from the Press, Sin and Confession in Colonial Peru, a Spanish sketch of penitential text. The first detailed study of how Europeans, the European sacrament of the confession was implemented in early modern Peru, by Andes. He has many other books, uh, for example, Entre el tonar, tronar épico y el llanto elegiaco, Simbología indígena en la poesía ecuatoriana de los siglos XIX y XX. We read those when we were in that school. For the exam. <laughs> eh, signos, cantos, memoria en los Andes, traduciendo la lengua y la cultura quechua. Eh, Sings, songs, and memory in the Andes, translating quechua language and culture, winner of the Catherine Singer Collin Book, Book Prize from the Modern Language Association. Eh, Professor Harrison is also a director, a producer, and a videographer. Among his documentaries, we can mention Cashing In on Culture, Indigenous Communities and Tourism. Uh, a result of a collaboration with indigenous Equatorians. Also, Mind to Death. And her last documentary has the beautiful title, Gringo Kuchki, right? mm -hmm. a, a Gringo Mono, about the, how the communities, the indigenous communities, react uh, culturally and also economically uh, to the dollarization of the economy in Ecuador. Please help me welcome Professor Harrison to Notre Dame. Uh, in her first visit to this institution, where she has a faithful and enthusiastic following in several departments. Thank you so much, everybody who I have eaten dinner with, breakfast with, lunch with, and dinner again tonight. Those who picked me up at the airport, uh, everyone, I'm very impressed with the amount of uh, institutions and people that Tatiana Botero had to uh, do in her list. It's an amazing group of people, and thank you, most of all, for inviting me. I really want to compliment those who work with Art in Motion. Uh, their website, the lesson plans, are, are energy that is impalpable to, to unparalleled. Uh, and also, Carlos, recognizing your Ecuador Unframed project, which got a lot of this going. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to speak of Ecuador, a country very dear to me. Uh, I, I'm aware that I owe Ecuador a huge intellectual debt uh, for taking me in in the Peace Corps when I first arrived in Ecuador. And um, just withstanding the fact that I couldn't seem to accommodate a subjunctive for years. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. so then again, I finally got fluent in Spanish, and I was back again, this time learning Quechua. So reduced to that baby state again, the headaches from trying to understand what people were saying. As you mentioned, I am a madrina of the Universidad Andina. One of my proudest moments, uh, I got to compose a short poem 
to Simon Bolivar, which is the Universidad Andina Simon Bolivar in Quichua, and I did it as if I were Manuela Science. <laughs> <laughs> and that resides in a special trophy case that the director has. So it's not a dream, it's a lover. <laughs> Ecuador and a debt that says I can never repay. So with that, I wanted to uh, give a very short uh, talk with you and show a lot of illustrations so that I know this time of the semester and this time of the day, uh, we might need some enlivening here. So bringing these uh, pictures to you. Uh, they're not all mine. I've taken them from various places. But I'm going to uh, read something. Uh, because that way I can stay on time, um, on track better, okay? So this uh, mural, which you can see right here, is one uh, recently constructed in Washington, D.C. by the Cuban-American artist Jorge Rodriguez Herrera. He made it out of clays and earth, a composite of the many people who have come to visit the Washington Monument. The lips, the eyes, the hair, of all those 29 million visitors to the mall are compounded here to create one likeness. He titled this E Pluribus Unum. It's only visible from an airplane, which I have to see because of your invitation, right? Or from the top of the Washington Monument. It's going to disappear. It's a landscape art, and it will disappear October 31st. Wayasi means art, on the other hand, is permanently with us. Not only the painting, but his description of how he created the masterpiece. The Indian, he says, <coughs> earthy colors. He is tierra firma, the serene, the stable. The black, yellows, reds, and greens for the music and the poetry. For the mestizo, the baroque, the distorted, the fractured, painted in gray, which expresses the unresolved condition of the mestizo. That's why Asimim described his own mural in colors of the earth, or reds, yellows, and greens, or a gray, as well as giving us emotional attributes of serenity and calm, or giving us the sound of music and poetry, as well as the distortion and the fractures. We have looked at this painting and have derived so much from it with our investigatory glance. We see in the classroom plans the multiple lessons that Guayasimin has left for us, from <coughs> combinatory mathematics to a history of art murals to painting, this was incredible, Cuba selfies on t-shirts, <laughs> and filling in the vocabulary blanks of a Neruda poem. While we keep the image here very much in mind, I now plan to take us away from this artifact for a virtual tour of Ecuador, where we smell the sea on the coast. Again, going towards the tropical forest now on the far east, where we brush the dense branches away in the tropical forest. And, map again, okay, to the central area of the Sierra, where we would like to scale the slopes of the ancient volcanoes. We will examine the facts of Ecuador, a small but important country, through the artistic lens of its greatest painters and writers as they shape the image of the nation. Ecuador is a heart for artistic production. These ceramic Venus models found on the coast of Ecuador are some of the oldest in South America. And this is a particular Venus uh, about 3000 BC found on the coast, an uh, incredible collection. And Ecuador boasts uh, the Inca presence, recorded in the finely hewn stones of the circular monument, Inga Pirca. Ecuador is difficult to make a composite painting, or a composite <laughs> landscape painting, similar to the one that we looked at in the mall on the Capitol. There are so many differences that work against this blend, as we'll see in maps, photos, and paintings. Outspoken, the, as usual, always, the poet Jorge Enrique Adon said about his country, Ecuador, what or who are we talking about when we say Ecuadorian? 
Is there a way of being Ecuadorian? Can we put all of our Ecuadorian faces on one national ID card? That's his question. Let's turn now to the North Coast, a place where the majority of the African Ecuadorian population lives. One of the earliest paintings of the colonial period is Adrian Sanchez Gualque's portrait of three wealthy kings from this region. Uh, the painter happens to be indigenous, being commissioned to paint these three Afro, now Ecuadorian kings. There's many a commentary on this portrait, one of the oldest in the colonial period. Uh, people always talk about it as wonderful, incredible. Uh, we notice here that these three gentlemen are wearing a mixture of clothing styles. Uh, they have very luxurious textiles in their ponchos, uh, nose piercings, gold jewelry, along with lace collars, lace sleeves, and they carry pointed spears. Who are they? These three son, father and son, represent the presence of colonial African Indian populations in Ecuador. They, surviving, they were surviving a shipwreck off the coast of Ecuador, <coughs> conquered native Indians in the area, intermarried, and became fierce warriors fighting against the Spanish. This painting in 1599 celebrates the submission of this mulatto population. And I say mulatto here uh, because it is painted in the cartouche that very much what you're talking about, how these terms for this uh, intermixing uh, change because after this period of time, mulatto no longer means a mixing of indigenous and uh, African, but will be termed sambo, right? John Phelan was, was looking at that. This commissioned portrait functions as a legal document, assuring the Crown that they were agreeing, <coughs> these gentlemen, to their exemption from paying taxes or tribute because they were loyal subjects. Barrio de Sepulveda proclaims in the cartouche, there in the right-hand corner, uh, his hand in their subjugation, calling them, and this is quoted in the cartouche, savages that until now have been invincible. In clothing them in Spanish garments, he clothes them in the aura of the Spanish nobility, although most blacks were held in much less esteem at this period of time. Afro-indigenous mulatto or sambo have made a substantial contribution to the literatures of Ecuador. This society on the coast has preserved a traditional poetic form called a decima, that's ten verses, that have been adapted locally and shaped by this population to expand to a form that covers over 44 lines. Often not written down, these poems are spoken by balladeers who have little formal education, but who nevertheless cover very well topics of religion, sexual attraction, historical battles, and ceremonies. A sample of one of these decimas reveals the pride of place and culture in the poetic form chanted by a master of the art form. Similar to the challenge of song common to the gauchos in Argentina, in this competition, the best singer wins. And I'll just read you part of it here uh, in the Spanish, and then my poorly, I'm trying to do the rhythm, but I'm not sure it worked. Con décimas bajas no, venga conmigo a glosar. La ciencia de compasa profunda se encierra en yo. And then I translate it. With your bad verses, no, don't come to poetize. The science of composize truly resides in me, yo. And this goes on to ask about the, the competitive singer's credentials. Tell me if your father was a man of great knowledge. In the belly of my mama, I was born with poetry. It's crazy for me to compose against you. Bring in another, bring me another equal to me, so <coughs> you can just listen in. Famed for their music and dance as well as their preservation of traditional links, we find in the decima form the cultures of the Christian Renaissance of Spain and Portugal, and also combined with it the storytelling griot techniques which are from the African diaspora. In this clip from the um, 
in, in this clip from the region, we see and hear the ancient format, a remembrance of reversion. So these decimas are human, they're called them alo humano, right? And also alo divino, or divine, or religious. And part of a fragment might be, I saw this vision in an afternoon fresh and clear. I was told that Maria gave birth and was a virgin, purer than the stars and more pure than daylight. And here we have downloaded from YouTube uh, one of uh, the instances of singing these virgin uh, decimas.
the marriage of an indigenous girl and a non-native white young man in 1879. This novel, Kumanda, uh, represents an impending marriage, uh, a dream of nationhood at the close of the 19th century, a blend that will stimulate progress within the modern nation called Ecuador. This foundational fiction that has been well studied by Dora Summer of interracial blending is common to many other nations after independence. And she goes through a list of these types of, uh, of, of uh, what she call it, yes, national nuptials uh, that are possible. Now, this marriage never came about. Kumanda and Carlos, who's wooing her here, fall in love, but they are never married. Their marriage is not consummated. And it's a good thing, because they are actually <laughs> brother and sister. <laughs> and, um, they have been separated uh, for a number of years because she was stolen by an indigenous group uh, on the hacienda in the Sierra. Uh, Carlos is now in the tropical forest as a young man. She has grown up with indigenous people and is one of, uh, of uh, indigenous <coughs> wives. Uh, she is uh, taken off to be sacrificed for various ritual reasons. Carlos hears that and dies of um, um, heart, uh, heart attack kind of thing. Very, very upset about what happened. So that spares us from going into uh, those details. But, but this is uh, a national novel. Very, still very much read. These chalky white figures stand out in sharp relief against the burden <coughs> background. But these are the real inhabitants these days. They are Kichwa speaking Runa, Shuar and Warani, who maintain, uh, try to maintain, their traditional way of life despite oil exploration, the incursions of television and radio, and increased tourism. I had been living in this tropical forest area uh, as a doctoral student um, working on collecting songs. You can see here uh, I am doing one of the numerous tasks of uh, what we call an anthropology participant observation, okay, which usually ends um, in the anthropologist being totally humbled and humiliated. My art project, since we're talking about art, okay, is attempting to draw with three strands of my hair tap, tied onto a small stick, these straight lines that are here on the ceramic. And this is typical of the ceramics from the tropical forest area, made by coiling clay, and then with the shell scooping it out so it becomes totally, beautifully thin, almost brittle, and then doing this decorative uh, act of painting with their own hair bristles, okay? So I loved living in the tropical forest uh, with the indigenous people, and when I became a university professor, I was able to take college students with me. We went to talk with these people and photograph them, uh, people who live there today, and we wanted to listen to them, listen to their analysis of the modern problems befalling them, with the ecological wars, in many cases, that descended upon them down those machete cut paths to their villages. Here is a clip uh, yeah, of, uh, from my first video made with my students, which is called uh, Cashing In on Culture. I want you to listen, not me, we're going to change immediately, to the, <laughs> to the values that these indigenous people express. Uh, their, their values as a people, their concern for their heritage, and their livelihood uh, in these modern days. Cuando vienen, los turistas son los que eran tan algo, ¿no? Que le ganan entonces los niños a costumbre de amar. Me siento al lado, tal vez ya en el pasado de México, y ya no ha dejado que los regalen, ¿no? Y eso cree que no se hace que es malo, ¿no? El mundo se maneja en un mundo de dinero. Y para los indígenas que estamos en este mismo mundo, pues no nos toca más que buscar formas de autofinanciarnos. A mí me conversaron los señores que han llegado turistas, solo cogen fotografías y parece que somos muy bien. Hay 
personas que realmente aman la naturaleza y nos quieren apoyar para seguir mant que mantengamos nosotros nuestra postura. Pero no sé hasta qué punto sea realmente es esa sinceridad de la gente para apoyar. Porque no conocemos, o no tampoco como, como un dicho vulgar que se dice, aprende a hablar el mismo lenguaje para que te defiendas. ¿no? Pero sentimos mucho a nosotros. No, querer, no, no poder hablar el lenguaje de las personas que nos visitan y así no poder hacer entender nosotros mismos a ellos. Porque <risa> nos visitan por traductores y yo no sé cómo les traducen los traductores. Y ahí, ahí, ahí cuando más viene a mí especialmente un, un sentimiento de, de que realmente nuestro, nuestro pensamiento no se está transmitiendo como es. <risa> Okay, catch your breath. We ascend to the Sierra, okay, 9,000 feet, the most frequently depicted area of Ecuador. Again, uh, we have a Casta painting. This is again by Vicente Alban in 1789. We do not have a downtrodden Indian indigenous person depicted here. <coughs> here is an upper class indigenous lady, gold on her neck, red coral bracelets on her wrists and sporting luxurious <coughs> textiles. Only her bare feet betray her indigenous origins, not her skin color in this depiction. The cartouche mentions avocados and mame and various other fruits delightful to eat. But we are also drawn, as we look in this picture, at the less fortunate indi indigenous figure in the background who is bearing a heavy basket in the fields behind her, revealing a difference of status. Alexander von Humboldt arrived in the Andes decades later to record accurately his measurements of the particulars of the volcanic expanses and the vegetation surrounding these snow-capped peaks. He was propelled here because of his aesthetic credo that combined emotion or feeling and science. His sketches, later made into colored plates, combined, as Stephen Jay Gould states, the detailed observation of the scientist with the skills of a painter who can create an imposing scene to reveal the unity of knowledge, to awaken feelings of <coughs> awe and sublimity in the viewers. Much credit has been heaped upon Holpo, but recently, because of Jorge Canizari's uh, research, we begin to understand how much Humboldt was tutored <coughs> by Creole intellectuals, learning how to read the Andes as a natural laboratory from their efforts. Humboldt's follower, Frederick Church, a North American, made two trips to the Andean regions of Ecuador, 1853 and 1857. As we can see in his spectacular paintings, he mastered and fully harnessed these two principles, science and awe. His triumphant oil, Heart of the Andes, when shown in New York City, was seen by a crowd of 12,000 people who paid 25 cents, a lot of money then, to view the painting. Framed by curtains and lit dramatically, opera glasses were provided to discern every botanical detail, every volcanic stratum. A composite of the geographical travels where Church followed in the footsteps of Humboldt, we sense that we are in a special terrain. The eye is drawn to the mountain, then the, to the middle area of the closer slopes, and finally to a village and church. Let's put on our opera glasses and look further into this. Very tiny are the figures of the indigenous who worship, bending towards a Catholic cross, far from the civilized edifice in town the Catholic Church. They perform their rites outside of the hallowed walls. They, in their ponchos, are outside society. However, it's in this same time period that Ecuador is recognized by many for a major cultural inclusion. This true son of Ecuador, Juan Leon Mera, is credited with including the words of the Sierra Indians, Quichua, in his literary production. As it says here, he was well rewarded for that. To the envy of many, he was appointed 
uh, the special correspondent <laughs> to the Real Academia Española, and uh, as I said, the envy of many. Furthermore, in his national anthology in 1892, he reproduces 34 <clears throat> quartets in Quichua, placing these quartets within the covers of the Cantares Ecuatorianos, giving them equal weight in a national literary tradition. And he's applauded for having done so by Spanish and Spanish-American writers who were fighting against the exclusion of including indigenous words. What's recorded in these folk lyrics? Nothing really weighty and philosophical, believe me. For instance, when I look at uh, what's in the Quichua verses, the Indian is often seen and depicted as having a particular botanical knowledge, an ability to cultivate plants. What kind of plants? The plants that are used for love potions, okay? <laughs> that, are, that fire up passions and make possible liaisons of love. And here's one of them. Colesta rangi senora, man and colesta munen. Kuyana yuyuka bangi, donita chaita pangui. The indigenous seller, buy some cabbage, senora. I don't need any cabbage. Do you bring any love potion? Do you with you? Ah, oh, my dear, give me that. On the Spanish side of things, the non quichua verses yield often a pathetic image of the life of the indigenous. Triste suerte la del indio, come mal y mal se viste, trabaja como un borrico, y hasta cuando se baila es triste. The Indian has bad luck. He eats and dresses so poorly. He works as hard as a burro, and even when he dances, he's sad. And that is what we see in the paintings in the 19th century, as it closes, in the watercolors of Joaquin Pinto, who traveled around painting and labeling people as to their <coughs> occupations, or uh, depicting the Ecuadorian traditions he saw being celebrated, in addition to the landscapes. In his many watercolors, we see the sad life of the Indian male or female carrying burdens, in this case a bed and a slaughtered lamb in the particular detailed manner of the costumbrista art movement of the time. And still bearing burdens, the indigenous protagonist, as we move to the 20th century, indigenous painters such as seen in Eduardo Kingman's La Minga. They shoulder the burden, adults and children, showing their strength as a community. Or they trudge on with tied up burdens, spurred on with the whiplash of the mountain overseer. Hands are prominent, hauling, hanging on to tump lines, or as we see with Yasmin, mm -hmm. uh, tenderly holding. Uh, a set of twins, as in this painting of 1944. Hands are predominating, but they're beginning to uh, loosen up, as we will see. Mm -hmm. What images could come forth now as we move beyond the nationalistic displays of the mid-20th century, those paintings we just saw? Currently, the notion of ever-increasing inclusion predominates in the legislative acts passed in Ecuador. <coughs> While some indigenous citizens be benefited from the agrarian reform of the 1960s, blacks remained largely invisible. Some rectification was undertaken in, in the 1998 Constitution, for specifically in Article 85, there is mention that rights given to native indigenous Andeans will be extended to Afro-Ecuadorian peoples. In addition, legislation by the Metropolitan Council of Quito specifically wrote ordinances that protected Afro-Ecuadorian blacks from racism in 2006. The Constitution of 2008 continued this trend of inclusiveness and protection of Afro-Ecuadorian and indigenous peoples, declaring that these people and the Montuvios, coastal peoples, coastal residents, as well as the landed citizens from communas, quote, form a recognized part of the Ecuadorian state, unique and indivisible. These hands, painted in ire and anguish, change in their more recent depiction. These hands, now softly cradle 
the concept of nation, as in Lugar Natal, the birthplace, painted by Eduardo Kingman in 1989. Now we see the fin fingers extend protectively to enclose the village lovingly. Yet as we look closely, this is a high mountain village. It excludes the coast and the tropical forest. Is there an answer to the dilemma of national identity? In addition to art, Ecuador itself provides a vibrant example of the ongoing solutions for the problems of inclusion and diversity. Ecuador's fourth region, the Galapagos Islands, may contribute some commentary to the debate regarding national identity, ideas of unity and diversity. Charles Darwin walked among the lava extrusions here. He even drew the shape of the islands in his notebooks in 1835. This is the one <laughs> few artistic representations of the islands I could find. He heard the hiss of the big turtle and wrote about the disgusting, clumsy lizards. <laughs> but it was the finches that ultimately proved his big theory, the 13 species of, as he said, the dull little birds. Each was equipped with a toolbox in its beak that enabled it to gather enough to eat in all different kinds of terrain. Although Darwin dashed prospects of a world united in a goal of harmonious equilibrium, that sublime worldview promulgated by Humboldt and Church, what we take away from his scrambling on the lava rocks of the Galapagos is a respect for the manner in which diverse species re respond to environmental changes and the inevitability that the species adapts to these changing conditions. This unpredictable laboratory of change offers us no grandiose human moral statement. Yet, by the existence of these species, we are encouraged to work towards a similar cultural landscape where cultural diversity is separate and valued. As we have legislated to protect this valuable region from the excesses of pollution and tourism, may there also be legislation that protects the cultural and economic rights of the buried human populations of Ecuador. As with the panels drawn by Wayatsimi, the ultimate arrangement of the mural, the final outcome, may be beyond our grasp, but the ability to reshape and rethink the arrangement remains multiple in its possibilities. So the, the ten decima yeah, lines at the beginning, 
are uh, they're more in the Christian Renaissance tradition. But what is so spectacular in Ecuador is that uh, the glossa, you know, the, yeah, the, the kind of yeah. gloss on it uh, is in fact uh, coming out of what some scholars would say is the Creo African tradition, right? So indicating uh, the forms of the diaspora that have arrived on the Pacific shores. And just how long do, do those sort of encounters like last? Like if there's a, a bout of poetic fighting, like what, you know, what is that? Is it like very impromptu or is it like hours or? Uh, so the 